Professor Sumita Parmar, Principal Investigator for the subject of Women's Studies. And today I will be presenting to you Module 4 of Paper 2. Paper 2 is on Women and Literature and Module 4 is entitled Reflections of the Three Waves of Feminism in Literary Writing. This has been written by uh, Aroma Karshing, who is from the English and Foreign Languages University, Lucknow. The varied developments in feminist thought are often documented as a series of three concomitant waves, usually referred to as three waves of feminism. Such historical accounts use the metaphor of the ebb and flow of waves in the sea to convey the intensity and the diversity of feminist concerns and movements in different epochs of history. It is generally agreed that the three waves of feminism began approximately in the 19th century and spanned the 20th century up to the 21st century, where they continue to explore new areas of feminist inquiry, inspiring what some critics call fourth wave feminism. Though there have been many instances of feminist writings before the 19th century, most, scho most scholars locate the rise of the first wave feminism in the late 19th and early 20th centuries in America and Europe. This period witnessed for the first time the rise of feminist thought and practice as a consciously deliberate and well-defined political movement. First wave feminism emerged in the backdrop of women's rights and women's suffrage movements in America and Europe, which played a major role in shaping its key liberal concerns. It chartered, it challenged the marginal status of women in society and claimed that men and women should be treated as equals and that women should have access to the same social, legal and economic rights and opportunities as men enjoyed. The right to vote was seen as not only a symbolic recognition of women's right to citizenship, but also an important step in ensuring their empowerment. One of the earliest advocates of first wave feminism, uh, feminist liberalism was Mary Wollstonecraft and her landmark, treat, landmark treaties of vindication of the rights of women, written in the wake of the French Revolution, argues for equality of the sexes and the civic and economic rights of women. Two other significant figures of the first wave, whose works reiterate the first wave's liberal concerns, are Virginia Woolf and Simone de Beauvoir. In A Room of One's Own, Woolf, one of the most acclaimed novelists of the 20th century, presents a powerful analysis of women's oppression. Taking up the charge of inf inferiority leveled against women, Woolf points out that genius is not a miraculous gift that one is born with, rather, it is a talent that develops when two important criteria are met. Firstly, a room of one's own, which is symbolic of independent space for women uh, as an individual, and secondly, financial independence. According to Wolf, the oppression of women in society is not a result of the natural order of things, but a consequence of stifling social uh, relationships as well as limited access to wealth. The French existentialist philosopher Simone de Beauvoir, her seminal work The Second Sex is a milestone that marks the turn of first wave into second wave feminism. According to her, Western philosophy has defined women primarily through their physicality whereas men have been defined through their intellect. This categorization replicates the mind-body division 
which posits that the mind is superior to the body, allowing men to occupy the superior subject position by virtue of his association with the mind, whereas women are relegated to the inferior category of the other. He is the subject, he is the absolute, she is the other. Her famous statement in the second sex that one is not born a woman but becomes one paved the way for future fe feminists to define gender as a social construct. Now the second wave feminism is closely allied to the radical feminist protests and women's liberation movement in the 1960s and 70s. These women's liberation movements emerged from socialist movements in post-war Europe societies, European societies and were characterized by their critique of capitalism and imperialism and their focus on the interest of marginalized and oppressed groups of society. The movements were protests against the, French, against the French colonial war on Algeria and the American war in Vietnam. There was also the Students' Revolution of 1968, lesbian and gay movements and the black civil rights movement. Second wave feminism picked up the first wave's battle for women's rights by shifting their focus to the critique of sexual difference structure round, structured around five main aspects biology, experience, discourse, the unconscious, and social and economic conditions. Feminists during this time focused on dismantling the claims of biological determinism that maintain that the destiny of women is determined by their bodies. This view claims that since the anatomy of woman is designed for reproduction, childbearing and domestic roles are their ultimate destiny. Some feminists invert this belief and claim that the biological attributes of women are a testament of their superiority and the female experience opens the door to a whole new way of thinking and feeling that is unique to women. This view is upheld by the most influential member of Anglo-American feminism, Elaine Shaw Walter who in her book, A Literature of Their Own, claims that women's writings are profoundly different from men's writings because women write from their own unique female life experiences. Discourse is another aspect around which debates of sexual differences are organized. Feminists such as Dale Spender assert that language is masculine and that it is not a neutral medium. In her man-made language, she claims that language is an instrument of patriarchy since it contains many features through which patriarchal assumptions find expression. The fourth focus, that on the unconscious, can be found in the theories of the French feminists Lucy Irigari, Eline Sizou, and Julia Kristeva, who used the psychoanalytic theories of the unconscious language and materialism to analyze the nature of women's oppression. One of the major contributions of the French feminists is their notion of l'écriture féminine or feminine writing that can subvert male-centered uh, language. Écriture féminine is the language of the female body, a language modeled on female sexuality that is plural, heterogeneous, open-ended, revolutionary, and subversive. The fifth focus is provided by the socialist feminists who adopt Marx and Engels' theory of capitalism and class struggle and link the inferior position of women to the alignment between capitalism and patriarchy. There are different strands uh, in second wave feminism. As we can see, second wave feminism is therefore not singular but plural. It becomes eclectic, drawing from the insights and approaches of various critical philosophical and intellectual traditions. It developed into divergent schools or thoughts of feminism. Some of the major schools of feminism in the second wave are radical feminism, liberal feminism, socialist Marxist feminism, radical lesbian feminism and black feminism. 
As we have seen earlier, radical feminism grew side by side with the women's liberation movement of the 1960s and 70s. The radical feminists took a combative stance against the manifestations of patriarchy in the personal domestic domain as well as the public political domain. Some of the rallying slogans of the radical feminists like the personal is political, the politics of housework, sisterhood is powerful outline their central concerns. Kate Millett's sexual politics uh, written in 1969, is a path-breaking analysis of patriarchy in the representation of women in literature in a, is a key peer, a work of the period. Her claim that the primary institution of patriarchy is the family inspired radical feminists in social, political as well as literary theory in the 70s. Another major figure of the 1970s and 80s was Shulamith Firestone, who played a key role in the formation of several radical feminist groups such as the New York Radical Feminists and the Red Stockings. In her famous work, The Dialectic of Sex, The Case for Feminist Revolution, she draws from Marx and Engels' theory of class oppression to analyze sexual oppression. Liberal feminism was inspired by Betty Friedan's seminal work, The Feminine Mystique. Friedan, who founded the National Organization of Women in 1966, articulated the basic premise of liberal feminism, which is the belief that the root of discontentment and frustration of the white heterosexual middle class woman in America was the lack of her social and political power. Socialist Marxist feminism developed as early as the late 19th century in the reformist socialist parties in Europe and in America in the backdrop of the rise of the Soviet Union. The early founders of socialist feminism were Rosa Luxemburg in Germany, Alexandra Kolontai in Russia, and Emma Goldman in America. These feminists focused particularly on working class women and their role in social revolutions and paved the way for the emergence of socialist feminist, feminists of the new left in the second wave. One of the key socialist feminists of the second wave is the British socialist historian Sheila Robotham. She is a crit she is critical of capitalism as well as traditional Marxist history for its neglect of the role of women in supporting the economy. Her famous work, Women's Resistance and Revolution and Hidden from History, explore the experiences of women in revolutionary movements in Cuba, Al Algeria, Vietnam, Russia, France and Britain and highlight the sexism in male revolutionaries towards their female comrades. Other influential writers are Cora Kaplan, Judith Newton, Deborah Rosenfeld, and Michelle Barry. The radical lesbian group came into existence in response to Betty Friedan's disparaging comment that radical lesbians formed a lavender menace to the feminist movement. The term has since then been appropriated by the radical le lesbians as a mark of protest against mainstream feminism that marginalizes lesbian feminism. In the manifesto of this group, the woman identified woman, the radical lesbians redefine and expand the term lesbian as a metaphor that is symbolic of every woman's rage against patriarchy and paths that lead to liberty. They also claim that categorization of sexuality into homosexual and heterosexual uh, predilections is a means of patriarchal control. Mary Daly and Monique Wittig are important voices among the radical feminist lesbianisms. Lesbians. Daly's controversial work, Gynecology, the Meta-Ethics of Radical Feminism, 
charts out a unique and radical feminist ethics that rejects patriarchal myths that organize the social world. In her book on lies, secrets and silence and compulsory heterosexuality and lesbian existence, Adrian Rich examines how the nexus of sexism, classism and racism bring into effect the norm of heterosexuality as a means of patriarchal control over women's sexuality. One of the early expressions of black feminism was a manifesto written by the Combahee River Collective, a group of black intellectuals that was formed in the 1970s, which was named after a slave revolt in 1863 in America. The collective's claim that black women were degraded by their white counterparts in the feminist civil rights movement and that the black woman faced multiple forms of oppression strikes the keynote concern of the black feminist movement. One of the early feminists who belonged to the tradition of black feminists is Audre Lorde, who was a poet and writer. An advocate of black lesbian feminism, Lorde wrote the article, The Master's Tools Can Never Dismantle the Master's House, where she claims that sexism and racism are the tools of patriarchy and can never dismantle the institution of patriarchy. Another influential black feminist is Alice Walker, who is widely known for her famous novel, The Color Purple. Her book, In Search of Our Mother's Gardens, Womanist Prose, which outlines her search for the lost voices of women artists who have been marginalized in history, is reminiscent of Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own. The need to acknowledge difference among feminists in terms of race, ethnicity and class led to the rise of what is known as identity politics in feminism. Identity feminism included the articulations of black feminists, working class and lesbian feminists and was a reaction against the claims of universal sisterhood of radical feminism that was based, based on shared experience. The advocates of feminist identity politics emphasize that since all women do not have the same experience of oppression, they are likely to develop divergent identities. Some of theorists associated with this strand of feminism are Bell Hooks and Gloria Anzaldua. Bell Hooks' work, Entire Woman, Black Woman and Feminism, was an early articulation of feminist identity politics. Another landmark work in this tradition is the feminist anthology, This Bridge Called My Back, writings by radical women of color, edited by Shuri Moraga and Gloria Anzaldua. Feminist standpoint. The rise of divergent feminism and feminist identity politics brought about a paradigm shift in second wave feminism, ushering in a new theoretical framework known as standpoint feminism in feminist thought. Feminist standpoint theory is based on Marxist thought and was first articulated by Nancy Hartsock. She replicates the Marxist model of class conflict within a feminist framework. Like Marx, she claims that women, via their struggles against, against patriarchy, uh, gain a superior understanding of the nature of their oppression. It is the struggle in standpoint of the oppressed which gives them the revolutionary insight into the structures of oppression and this in turn would help them to dismantle such forms of oppression and theories are the, and, they, and these theories are therefore dependent on the historical local context of the oppressed groups. The growing recognition of diversity that marked the latter part of the second wave le led to the rise of third wave feminism, which carries forward many assumption, assumptions of the first and second wave while adding unto them new dimensions of feminist thought and practice. Third wave feminism developed in the context of a new global world order that was characterized by the fall of communism the rise of a new post-colonial world order, the growth of ethnic and religious fundamentalism, and the development of contemporary technological trends such as information technology and biotechnology. 
Like the second wave, third wave feminism is divergent and, and plural, marked by varied theoretical positions and practice. Some new articulations of feminist thought in the third wave are postmodern feminism, postcolonial and third world feminism, and global feminism. The third wave is therefore marked with a continuous negotiation between feminist theory and politics with the forces of globalization and the new complex redistribution of power in the global scenario. Postmodern feminism, gender as performance. A significant aspect of postmodern feminism that emerged in the third wave is the perception of gender as performance. In Gender Trouble, Judith Butler defined gender and sexuality as an effect of performance that are repeated so often that they begin to appear natural and stable. Gender as performance posits that gender, whether masculine or feminine, is created artificially through social practices such as the actions, expressions and behavior that determine masculinity and femininity. In other words, gender is not natural. There are no natural men and women. The term queer theory was coined by the Italian feminist and film theorist Teresa de Loretis in 1990. Queer theorists challenge all forms of sex and gender categorization and claim that self-identity, behavior, body and sexuality are all subject to performativity. Though their roots can be traced to the lesbian and gay movement of the 1970s, queer theory expands its scope to include a radical political critique of all forms of identity. They differ from lesbian ethics and gay rights movements in that they reject all forms of identities and norms as signs of cultural dominance. The new global order also necessitated the need for global feminism that can build connections between women all over the world and find common ground for political action while acknowledging their differences in terms of class, culture, religion and ethnicity. Global feminism aspires to challenge all forms of sexist elements within their own cultures as well as other cultures, while at the same time striving to maintain respect for each other's cultures and their national sovereignty. The key concerns of global feminism are to ensure human rights, political coalition and empowerment. Postcolonial feminism and third world feminism are other important articulations of feminism in the third wave. They constitute a divergent group of feminist voices from varied nations who have experienced colonialism. For these feminists, the term third world is indicative of marginalization, poverty and exploitation that may be experienced anywhere irrespective of one's location. A fundamental aspect of third world feminism is a systematic critique of hegemonic Western feminism and an attempt to formulate autonomous feminist theory that is grounded in the specific historical, geographical and cultural circumstances of women. Conclusion, some critical reflections. Some feminists have gone on to critique the categorization of feminism into three successes waves as a misrepresentation of the feminist project. They have pointed out that the three waves terminology assumes that the issues that the preceding wave focused on were either accomplished or obsolete by the time its successive wave rose into prominence. Such assumptions are misleading since we cannot claim that the key concerns of the first wave such as legal rights and equal opportunities for women have been accomplished equally in all communities in the world. Moreover, the struggle for women's legal rights is an ongoing battle since feminists continue to fight to maintain the victories obtained by their feminist predecessors. Second, the terminology also promotes a historical version of feminist movements as singular and linear. Feminists have pointed out that this generational understanding of feminist movements is entrenched in race and class biases, privileging a view of feminism that is Western, 
and middle class. It accounts for the feminist movement in the Western context while it disregards feminist movements from other parts of the world and ignores the fact that the feminist critical project is composed of divergent voices from women of varied nationalities, races, ethnicities, classes and orientations. One can adopt a thematic interpretation of the three waves as outlined by schools in Feminism A Beginner's Guide. The thematic interpretation of the three waves considers the three waves metaphor not as generational moments, but as concentric circles, a series of expanding circles that have a common center. The image that schools uses as an analogy to illustrate the thematic interpretation of the waves of feminism is that of ripples that are created when raindrops hit the still waters of a pond. She urges us to think of each wave of feminism as equivalent and parallel ripples that are formed at the pond when the rain drops fall on the tranquil water. The concentric circles of these ripples blend and merge one into another through successive circles widens as successful circles widen the perimeter, the perimeter of the previous circles. According to the thematic interpretation, the concerns and focus of the first wave is common to the second and third wave since it envisions the successive waves uh, building upon the efforts and accomplishments of the preceding waves and expanding them. This interpretation believes that the second wave builds upon the first wave's focus on legal rights and opportunities for women and expands them by providing a broader and detailed analysis of how different structures of oppression operate in society. Accordingly, the third wave, influenced by the intellectual developments and turns of events in the post-colonial, post-modern global order, turns towards structures of language and, and, con and consciousness to identify hidden sites of oppression to dismantle it. Though it has been said that the terminology of waves of feminism is no longer useful for the modern feminist movement, it would be worthwhile not to disregard it altogether, since it has been a useful framework to understand the women's rights movement of the past and has provided us with the frame of reference to understand that the feminist project is marked by contestations and contradictions continuities and disruptions which have enriched the debates in the field. Thank you.